Welcome to the Unearthed Man Podcast, the journey becoming a conscious man, hosted by Milva. Hey all, Milva here, and welcome to episode 34 of the Unearthed Man Podcast. To kick off, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we work and gather, and their continuing connection to land and waters. I pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. I pay tribute to the diversity of First Nations peoples of Australia and their ongoing culture. Now, if this is your first time listening to the podcast, then welcome aboard. If you're one of my regular listeners, then welcome back. I really appreciate your ongoing support. If you're looking to know more about the Unearthed Man, then you can find me on Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. So before we kick into today's episode, uh, what a great chat with Corey McCarthy last week. As I mentioned in the episode, to have someone of Corey's age already having awareness and starting to live his true life gives me faith that we have true male leaders that are coming up in the future. So on to this week's guest. I recently had the privilege of attending the Amend Movement Movement Men's Workshop in Melbourne, facilitated by this man. And what I immediately noticed was his intense positive energy, which underpinned a very humble, quietly spoken gentleman. It was clear that this man had embodied true King energy. I was also keen to meet him as he was my wife's coach during her initial journey at Bridge and Extreme and one, as one of the first people who really saw her and gave her permission to see herself. For this, I'll be forever thankful. He, has, he is a devoted father to four beautiful children based on the Gold Coast of Australia. He grew up in Napier, New Zealand, in what most would define as a violent and dysfunctional home and neighbourhood. He has faced many obstacles in his life, from having a child of 15 years old who was born with cancer, being diagnosed with cancer himself, and also his 11-year-old daughter being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. He has 12 years' experience in the mental health sector, and more recently is a practicing social worker at a behavioral school for the past eight years. He's also worked within and closely with the Department of Child Safety for the past 13 years. He has a deep passion for helping human beings become better through his own life experience and training. He's the co-founder of the AMEND movement. When I approached him at the workshop to be a guest on the podcast, his response was, I don't do podcasts and that sort of thing. However, for you, my brother, I'd love to. I still get emotional today thinking about that. So before the tears really start to flow, it is with immense gratitude and love that I welcome to the Unearthed Man podcast, Martin Wanger. Hey, Wa, how are you, brother? I'm really good. Thanks, bro. Uh, thanks for that introduction. It made me a little bit emotional hearing someone else speak into it. So I appreciate that. And I also appreciate your, your time and your space today, bro. No, look, that's fine, man. And uh, as, as we said before we get on here, it's just, I'm really honored because I know that you don't uh, spend a lot of time on, on podcasts or doing things like that. And the fact that, mm. you know, you looked at me in the eye and said to you, brother, I would do this. Um, it really touched my heart because for me, that showed exactly, you know, the true man that you are, that you, you're a very heart driven person. Um, you just have a lot of compassion and love for, you know, the men and the women that you run the workshops for. And, you know, that comes through from you know, everyone that talks about you, everyone that sees you, um, so yeah, I just want to put out there and say thank you for being you and for providing this beautiful space for all us to operate in. You're welcome, bro. This is uh, the second podcast I've ever done. <laughs> uh, there are many reasons for for not doing the podcast, but uh, the reason for doing the podcast is the connection that we had at the the I mean, workshop and all the things that you spoke into. And I felt your heart that when you were speaking to, you know, helping men in particular. Uh, I really felt that. So, you know, when you requested that we jump on a podcast together, I was like, how are yes. Um, and also I've got a lot of love for your wife as well. So, Yeah, no, they, like, uh, Jackie just absolutely loves you, man. Um, ever mm. since, you know, she still, we still talk about her experience and, you know, the, the help and support and guidance you gave her um, back at, uh, back during the, those weekends. Um, so let's take a bit of a uh, work on a, a journey. Um, so, why as the man or the boy growing up in this in Napier, New Zealand, um, mm. violent, dysfunctional household, you, you're now this man who's providing all these supports, services for children, men, women. Um, can you take us on a bit of a journey about what, what life looked like for you, you know, back then as a, as a young man growing up, um, what those challenges were, um, some of the uh, traumas or some of the you know, situations that you've had to face into? Yeah, absolutely, bro. Uh, so for me, I, I the way I word it is I've lived a fairly colourful life. 
lots of different environments that I've been a part of, um, experienced lots of different things that some human beings may never experience. Um, for all those experiences, I'm really grateful because I love the human being that I am today. And without those experiences, I may not be the human being that I am today. Um, so you like you said, I grew up in a household in Napier, New Zealand. Uh, four sisters, I've got four sisters and one brother, so six children. And my dad <clears throat> uh, was a person who was very violent uh, physically and emotionally. Um, he taught all of my siblings, including myself, that to sort everything out with physical violence. Okay. And that's exactly how I lived life. Um, you know, we talk about... We, act, we can only do what we know. You know, yeah. I knew nothing other than violence. So through my schooling, uh, primary school and high school, uh, unfortunately, however, I do see fortunate inside of that too. Um, I sorted everything out with violence. Um, I remember at five years old, I think it was my third day of primary school, school requested I was put into an anger management program wow. and otherwise I would be exempted from that school. Uh, so my parents put me into the program and I remember after the very first session that we'd done, we walked out and a kid teased me for being in an anger management program and I beat him up. Um, yep. I'm not proud of that. Um, again, I know these experiences have had um, formed and helped build the, the human being that I am today. Uh, moving forward, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old, sorry, 14, 15 years old. Um, that's probably most, my most violent years where I was a very hurt human being, mm -hmm. um, in particular from my dad. And my dad and I have had these conversations where he has said, you know, he singled me out. I was the black sheep of my siblings. Uh, and the reasons for that is I was the most reckless out of all my siblings. Yep. So, and, and all, all he knew how to deal with things was through, through hitting us. Um, the other flip side of that is I was my dad's mirror. So all yeah. the things that he did not like in himself, he was seeing in this little boy. So And he didn't have the knowledge or the tools to navigate his way through that, so would take it out on me. Um, and 14 and 15 came along for me, and I, that hurt little boy just wanted to hurt other human beings. Mm. So I went about those years hurting a lot of human beings, um, and then when I was 16, I was fortunate enough. So when I was 15, my children's mother fell pregnant. And when we were 16, um, you know, on the 19th of November, we had our first child. And that was probably my biggest blessing because mm. having him, I now had to start thinking about another human being. And because I, I truly didn't care about myself, yep. whether I was safe, whether I was unsafe, it did not bother me. Um, so when I had this little baby in my arms, I was like, wow, the world changed for me that day. Um, and yes, I was still that human being when I was 14 and 15 years old, but things started to shift for me. And yep. for that, I'm really grateful. Um, moving forward a few years, I started working at a behavioral school for boys uh, 8 to 15 years old who have been exempted from mainstream schooling. And it was a very different school. So heavily based around human values. Uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to education. And when I first uh, rocked up to that school, I, if I'm being completely honest, I thought, what the fuck is this? They're meditating. They're talking about their, their heart spaces and clearing the mud and finding the diamond in the human beings. Mm. Um, thankfully, I stuck around at that workplace because I cared about the little human beings that were in that, in that space. Yep. You know, because I was that little human being, you know, these kids that were smashing the school up, the kids that were abusing staff members, you know, the kids that everyone else had given up on, I 100% was there for. Why? Because I was looking at myself. Yep, yep. So it's like everyone gave up on me, bar a few people. So I will choose to stand beside these children regardless of how they show up. Um, and that, that workplace, which I'm still currently working at and have been for uh, nine years now, you know, was a big shift for me. Meditation is a big thing in my life now. Mm -hmm. um, breathing is, is a big thing in my life now. And just conscious conversations, the conversations that we get to have as staff members at that school uh, with each other and with, with boys. Uh, so that was a big part for me. And then a few years ago, um, I sort of got into the self-development 
world uh, which really opens my mind up and opens my heart up to all the things that I feel like I'm being today. Um, so you know, that's just a snapshot in a nutshell of things that have played out for me um, and how I got to where I am today. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing that, man. Um, so, so if you don't mind, I just want to go back a little bit. Uh, the one thing that you touched on was, you know, um, sort of growing up, not knowing any different because that's all your dad sort of knew. And you talked about, you know, there's that balance between, you know, there are, I'm not sure whether regrets are the right word or not, but there are things we look back on that we may not have been proud of, but there's things we look back on and go, well, I'm not going to be who I am today if I hadn't have gone through some of those experiences. So can you talk in a little bit about, you know, that just that conditioning and that self-belief system that, you know, you grew up with because, you know, when you grow up in a, in a family, you know, dads either don't provide the love or don't provide the hugs or, you know, provide mm. violence and everything else. They don't know any different and you don't know any different. So, you know, what does that look like for you sort of moving forward now as well? Yeah, hundred percent. So just as quickly, my dad was only doing what he knew with what he had, mm. you know, and I understand that now. So I have a whole lot of compassion for him and a whole lot of love for him also. Um, going back to the question of, you know, experiences and the programming, um, I guess to sum it up, it was like hurt people before they hurt you. Yeah. That was what I lived by um, because, you know, when I was that little kid in a home where I had zero control um, of what happened to me or for me, uh, as soon as I had somewhat, you know, the physical presence to, to look after myself, I utilized that to my the fullest advantage. And I wasn't willing to relinquish that anywhere because I didn't want to go back to that scared little boy who was always hurt, who mm. was hiding under the blankets, you know, who was putting hoods over his head to, to feel safe, uh, to get away from all the things that were happening outside of the bedroom uh, or, or the environment that I was finding myself in. Um, so yeah, I would I would hurt people before they hurt me, and and the most, I guess the strongest space that showed up for me uh, was in my relationships. Um, I've yeah. had I've had two uh, relationships. One was eleven years with my children's mother, and I had a marriage that was five years. And you know, on the outside, things looked great, just like it did at home. You know, when we were kids, on the outside, things looked great for the most part. But behind closed doors, things were not great. Um, mm. And definitely for my first relationship, you know, things looked great on the outside. But behind closed doors, I wasn't the best partner. You know, some things happened in that relationship where I put a lot of blame onto my children's mother. Even up until, you know, six or seven years ago, I still was blaming her for those, uh, that her actions but when I got really clear with what was happening and below the surface, you know, my actions were probably playing, no, not probably, my actions were playing a lot more inside of her actions uh, uh, than, than hers were yeah. um, because I was a very dominant energy and, you know, spiritually, emotionally, um, and, and even somewhat physically, mm -hmm. I was abusive. And, again, I'm not proud of that. Um, I don't have regrets anymore because I've worked through a lot of my stuff. And again, I truly believe that all the experiences made me who I am today. And I fucking love who I am today. Yeah. So yeah, that program was deeply ingrained into me and some of it still is deeply ingrained into me. And I'm constantly having to work through that um, daily. So mm. it's like this journey never ends. You know, I'm going through something right now in regards to um, being given you know, I'm a person who I've, I've known this patterning, this pattern, sorry. Uh, I didn't know how deep it was up until an experience I, I put myself into, you know, five or six weeks ago. Mm. I don't like being given direction. And where that comes from is that little boy who had no control, when he had the control, he was full in control and he's not relinquishing that for anyone because if he relinquishes it, he's going to go back to feeling unsafe again. So when even people are coming from a place of love and they're giving me direction, that little boy shows up and is like, fuck you. Yeah. I don't want anything to do with this, you know, and the situation I put myself in right now is I've gone to one of my best friends to ask for some support around, you know, training ethics and methods and eating ethics and methods. And 
he's given me direction and my little rebel is showing up saying, fuck you, don't tell me what to do. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's given me some clarity of how deeply this is showing up in all other areas of my life. So although it's uncomfortable right now to be sitting in that space, I'm grateful because I know I'm learning so much about myself. Yeah, and I think that's what people um, sometimes forget is that, um, and, and I'll talk, I'll touch on something coming up soon about what you discussed in in the workshop about how the children come out to play when we're having conversations. Mm. Um, and I loved how you put that. Um, but yeah, it shows up a lot. I, I mean, I just recently had a, a situation where um, I would go and do something, and then Jackie would, you know pick on something that maybe wasn't done right or may not have been done to her view. And like, I'd have this constant adverse reaction. And, and then I realized that, you know, again, my, my dad was a carpenter, but a perfectionist in everything he did. Like every picture in the house was perfectly square and, you know, lined up and everything. And so I, in my childhood, I felt like I could never be enough or was never perfect enough or never good enough. So now if I'm cleaning or doing something around the house, some really mundane tasks that no one really gives a shit about, if she goes, oh, you missed a bit or this didn't happen, like my, all of a sudden I'm reacting, I'm, well, fuck off, do it yourself. Mm. <laughs> but, but it's because of that never feeling I could ever meet that expectation of, you know, what I was carrying in the past. So now when it comes up, I go, oh, actually, who is this coming up for now? And what's happening in my life and really what is that trigger is it because i never met my dad or my mum's expectations and i can now move beyond that and go okay well that's cool i don't have to meet that anymore i can actually change how i operate and yeah the fact that these things will continually pop up for us is is a really powerful tool for us to learn from i, I definitely feel 100 percent, bro and i'm really glad that we're having this conversation i hope a lot of men listen to, actually i hope a lot of human beings listen to this because there is a direct connection between what played out for us in our childhood as to what's showing up for us right now. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, I need to uh, navigate my way through what's happening right now. You know, the best way to navigate that is go back to your childhood because there's things in that that happened for you that are helping you to or not helping you to uh, around the way that you're showing up today in your adult life. You, know, you talk about worthiness. Bro, I had... My dad, you know, I felt like I was never worthy of him acknowledging me, of seeing me, of saying, I love you, son. Mm. So that showed up in all areas of my life, you know. Am I worthy of this relationship? Because I was sabotaging both my relationships right throughout because I didn't feel worthy of them. You know, all these beautiful and amazing things that are happening for men right now. There's times I have to catch myself and say, I am worthy of all this beautifulness um, and I am as opposed to what was uh, programmed into me from my childhood as yes. I wasn't worthy. Yeah, I, I look, it's um, just on that point, and, and it is so true, the one thing that I've only recently been able to start to do is effectively dance naked in, in front of a mirror right? Mm. because there's this whole, you know, again, like when I was younger, I was a super fit, you know, um, guy and, 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 but through this whole thing is like, there's this constant competition I had with my brothers about, you know, an older brother and a younger brother. So you're always competing against them and, you know, where you ranked at school and this constant competition just leaves you in this view of where is my worthiness and, and where do I sit? And, you know, so now at the, you know, tender age of 53, I'm actually got music on and I'm actually, you know, dancing naked, brushing my teeth in front of a mirror and going, hey, this is a pretty cool dude in front of me, right? And it's a really <laughs> nice place to land into because I'm like, this is really fun now. Like, and, you know, but even like if Jackie was to walk past, it's like a bit of embarrassment. And I'm mm. like, hang on a minute, what's, where's that coming from? Again, was it, 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 that's something back in my childhood where, you know, don't be silly, don't, don't do this. You know, your parents, you know, always putting, saying, don't be silly, be play by the rules and, and everything else. So all these little things just, I think we just got to keep leaning into them learning mm. that there's a bit of discomfort that comes from it, but going, yeah, but that's okay. But where's that come from? Um, cause, cause I know that, well, th th there was two things from the workshop, but I'll, I'll go into one of them now is one of the things you actually said is you get to a point where you go, Oh, fuck, this is fun. Now that this has come up, yeah. <laughs> where, where is this, where is this come from? Like, Oh, I'm going to have some fun journeying down that path and investigating. And, and I loved how you talked to her into that piece. Mm. Yeah, bro, 100%. Like when I first started, I guess my journey started nine. For me, 
if I had to have a definitive point, it would be nine years ago when I started in that workspace that I, I spoke into earlier. Uh, but when I spoke, I fell into the, uh, the self-development world, uh, you know, 12 months in, I was like, fuck, it would have just been easy to stay like <laughs> fucking shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because <laughs> that was so much easier than all the stuff that's happening in that moment, I was saying to me, I now know it was for me um, because of my mindset around it was like, this is draining. This is exhausting. My mindset around the work now is like, oh, yes, there's a trigger. I fucking love this. What do I get to learn about myself? But also, how can I play in that space? Because, mm-hmm. you know, this work, when we look back in the mirror to find out who we are, can be daunting. I truly believe it's the most daunting thing that any of us will ever do. But we can also look in that mirror and play in that space like a little kid, like you do, dancing in front of the mirror, you know, with no clothes on. Mm. Like, that's cool. For, for me, that's now cool. If you see that 10 years ago, I said, what the fuck's that shit? <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. But now it's cool. So when I'm triggered, when I'm sitting in discomfort, I'm like, oh, sometimes it still feels icky. But I get to shift that and reframe that thought that's not serving me to amazing what am i learning how can i play in this space yeah no absolutely I, uh, and i'm like lo- same thing I, i'm i'm no longer rejecting it i'm embracing it and going okay let's jump over here and, and, and have a bit of fun in this space and, and it's so cool to do um yeah. one of the things i want to actually talk to you about uh is there's a point where you felt you didn't have a voice now you, you know, you're seen as mm. you know rightly the the lead of the men movement you know and there are thousands of people who just follow your story and follow your journey and see this person who's out there and as i said in the intro like you know when you walk into a room there's this presence it's this intense positive energy but the humbleness and the gentleman aspect comes from it which is for me just that king energy but there's a point where you know you felt you didn't have a voice that you weren't there to be able to talk up or or even have that non-verbal presence what what changed for you? How did that take place? And what journey did you go through to be able to get to this beautiful voice that you have now? Yeah, cool. I really love this question. And this has been a really yucky, beautiful, and amazing part of my journey. And, and I love this because I truly love speaking in front of human beings now. Um, <clears throat> when I first started working at the school that we've spoken about a few times now, each Monday, one of the staff members, we call it story time because there's so much power in sharing stories, mm. um, and, and particularly with uh, amazing little children. And each time it would get to me, my heart would start to race and I would shut down and then I would go and see the principal and say, I can't do it. And he was very understanding and he would allow me to step out of that space. So every staff member was speaking except for Wa. And... When it re- things really changed for me is when I stepped into a room with Preston Smiles and he called me forward on that. Okay. And following being called forward on that, I stepped into a few tasks which helped me to realize why I was so anxious when I was asked to speak in front of human beings, in particular adults, is because I felt safe, unsafe around adults. Mm. The little boy, so little Wa, every time he spoke as a kid, he got hit. He got punched. He got told to shut the fuck up and do as you're told. So my body, every time I was asked to speak, the anxiety would show up. And the story my body was being told is, if you speak, you're going to be hurt. So don't speak. When I realized this, I was like, ah. And each time that anxiety would show up and that story would show up, I would literally plant my feet and and affirm to my body that I'm safe. And then ask Mm. myself the question, do I actually want to speak in this moment? And if the answer was yes, I started to speak through the anxiety, through the sweaty palms, through the heart pumping out of my chest. And the more often I'd done that, the less the sweaty palms would show up, the less the heart would pump through my chest. You know, And I'd done that so many times that all that has fallen away. And each time I step into a space of wanting to speak, I really love it and I really enjoy it. And it's been a, the most beautiful part of my journey because it's something that I have on my heart is like, I want to speak in front of thousands of people, like, because I love speaking. I love sharing a story and I love sharing tools or things that I've learned about myself or other experiences I've had with other human beings. So yeah, it was that I felt unsafe and my story was I'd be hit and I was able to work my way through that and navigate it. And now I absolutely love speaking. 
Uh, and thanks for sharing that because, yeah, it's found funny. I, I host a podcast. I work in IT corporate where I've got, you know, hundreds of people working for me. Um, you know, I've been known to have an opinion, which I'm certainly mm. aware of where that's showing up in my life. And I'm trying to actually ease out of the uh, opinion driven ego stuff. Um, but you put me in front of somebody like a group of people with a microphone and like, it's, it's like, I've got, you know, um, some disease, like the microphone's shaking, my whole voice is shaking and, and I just collapse around. And it's sort of really funny, this, what the, uh, duality or dichotomy between, you know, being seen as this, um, uh, what's the right word? Sort of like positive, energetic, uh, confident person in some states. Mm. And then over here, like I'm just a, a shaky, nervous, anxious sort of mess. And I, don't, I know it's an area that I'm trying to work through as well at the moment to go, you know, what, what is appearing? What is it? Which child is standing? So which, which of my previous children, yeah, is in not my uh, biological kids, but my own children. Yeah. What experience did they have that resulted in them not wanting to do this? Were they laughed at school? Were they laughed at, you know, in front of parents or were you told, you know, kids aren't seen, you know, can't be heard but only seen or whatever, you know, these sorts of things. But, yeah, it's a, and I know a lot of men and a lot of people really ch- are challenged with that, being able to, you know, have the voice and, and actually put the voice out there. So it's, a, it's an interesting space to, to try to operate in, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Feelings that show up for all of us every single day are just feedback. You know, as if, if we ask ourselves the question, are these feelings, or actually, more importantly, the behaviours that follow those feelings, are they serving our, the highest version, uh, our highest self? And if it's no, it's like, cool, now we get to go back and navigate where that comes from. Where was a seed planted for us? So I love that you're going back and... and all of us that go back and say, okay, where did this come from for me? Was it when I was at school and kids laughed at me? Because it can be simply that one experience. It doesn't have to be reoccurring experiences that have got us to a place of a behavior that doesn't serve us. Mm. And, and I think the other thing too in here is that people sometimes look at, and you know, you, you had lived in a family, some violent upbringing, you know, where that's all you sort of knew. There are some other people who like, Again, they would look at their life going, but my mum and dad really loved me, but this was okay, but I've still got all these challenges. Mm. And sometimes it's not as the language that was used around them constantly about, or, you know, like they never, they never hit them. And they always food on the table and they felt like they were privileged, but they've got this whole, uh, I suppose, built up sets of traumas over a period of time of, again, probably the worthiness or never felt good enough. And so I think, the thing that comes up with a lot of people who go, well, I can't compare myself to this person mm. is, you know, I was never, I was never traumatized. I was never sexually abused or I was never, you know, I never had these bad experiences. So therefore I, I just need to get over myself, you know, type of thing. And yeah. I think, again, it's, it's something that we need. People just have to have the awareness that trauma is a trauma. There's no comparison yeah. to trauma because it's affecting you. And it's how it's affecting you and how it's showing up for you that's important and what how you can work through that rather than trying to compare it and then just suppressing it. Mm. I think, uh, you know, for, for lack of better words, you know, like, well, sorry, like you said, trauma is trauma. And it's, it's easy to see the big traumas. It's the little minute ones that we miss. And we're like, oh, no, that wasn't trauma. We bypass it. Where, in fact, those little minute things are actually affecting us as much as the big thing that people can all see. And a great example of that, bro, is, um, you know, like we've said a few times now, I grew up in a very violent household. Uh, and my household is the complete opposite of that. I have three children of my own. I uh, had my nephew living with us for five and a half years. And of those four children, and if I'm being completely honest, I have smacked all three of my children once each. And I, again, I'm not proud of that. Um, however, for my two sons, not my daughter, because I've had this mindset of allow her to be free, you know, treat women beautifully, uh, because I wasn't that at one stage. Uh, my two boys have been traumatized by the words because I said so. Mm. I said those words enough times to my children, my two boys, uh, that it created a program for them that my voice 
is not worthy, so I'm not going to speak anyway. Because when I ask a question, oh, why would I have to do that, Dad? Because I said so. Okay, I might as well not speak. And to add to that, you know, for example, I would say, right, what would you like for dinner to like? Would we like Chinese or Thai? And my boys would sit there and shrug their shoulders. And I'd start to get frustrated. Like, it's a simple decision. Why are you making this difficult? And they're like, Mm. I don't know. And I'd start to shut down and their bodies would shake. Mm. So this, because I said so, it created a pattern for my boys to have no voice and also not be able to make decisions. Trauma. And that will start to show. I'm glad that I was able to, I was aware enough to catch that and help them navigate that. Uh, because that would have it was showing up in their school spaces, it was showing up in their friendship spaces, and now we've navigated that. You can see the confidence they walk around and bang, I'll make a decision and I'll go with it. So yeah, trauma is trauma. Yeah, and and, and yes, we can be dismissive of you know if you like the psychological trauma. You know that that uh, a, a king, the shadow of the king, can operate in two things: either by by hand. You know, so basically be tyrannical by hand, which is like physical, or actually be tyrannical purely by um, authoritarian. You know, you will listen to me because I am your father and therefore you shall do exactly what I do and I'll stand over you and I'll posture over you. And so you may not hit them, but all the other gestures of standing and posture and voice and tone absolutely can create as much trauma in, um, you know, in kids' lives um, purely because, yeah, you know, one either that's all you ever knew as a child because mm. that's how your parents brought you up. I know in my household, you know, um, there was always the the wooden spoon, or and as my dad said, he never used his leather strap, but he's a school teacher. But the leather strap was always in the drawer, and it was yeah. always a threat to come out. As said, he never ever used it, but the fact that, that it was there, and you know that that's enough for you to go, oh, you know, maybe you know wherever I push the line, or there's a point sometimes where you go, oh, fuck it, go on then, bring it on. Like, don't threaten yeah. me anymore. Yeah. And again, that just brings out a whole lot of different set of behaviors around, you know, challenging authoritarianism and, and all these sorts of things that come along. Yeah. I was very fixated on, I'm the dad who doesn't hit his children like my dad did. So I'm the man. Everything else I do is totally accepted. Mm. Um, and up until two and a half years ago, uh, that was very much me, the authoritarian. Yes, I wasn't hitting my kids, but I was hitting my kids just as much as my dad was hitting me with my words, with my energy. You know, I've got such a strong energy when it comes to my children that dad just literally has to raise his eyebrows and my kids know exactly what I'm saying. However, the past two and a half years, in particular, last six months, I've been working beautifully and tirelessly through that energy uh, and a phrase that I use to sum that up is make my children right always and people are like what do you mean by that and like regardless of how they show up i will ask questions to prompt exploration for themselves and a simple example of that is i don't like children when they swear Mm -hmm. Um, interesting because i swear a lot myself however my youngest has built a patterning of swearing every now and then and the old man would literally raise his eyebrows and say what the fuck are you swearing for interesting ask him not to swear by using swear words Mm. the eyebrows and the energy that sent his way what i'm actually doing with that is i'm shutting my son down as a why did i use those words why did i what was i feeling before i used these words now what I'm doing with all my children, regardless of how they show up, is I will lean into making them right by asking questions. Why did you choose to use those words? Why did you choose to behave this way? And whatever they I receive in return is 100% okay. Because if I receive something in return that I, from my view, I don't like, and I'm like, well, that's not fucking right. Again, I'm shutting them down. Mm. So I now have these three children who are, uh, exploring themselves on a daily basis with the support of their dad, therefore are going to show up as adults who just explore their thoughts, explore their feelings, explore their behaviors, you know, the snap of the fingers, conscious human beings. So I'm grateful that that concept came into my space now and not when they're 20 years old and dad's having to go, you know, help them navigate when they're adults as opposed to when they're children. Yeah, uh, absolutely love that. Um, I'm at that end of the scale now, uh, sadly, because, you know, I sort of 
become more aware and consciously aware. Been on a journey for a, a period of time, but certainly the last two years has been a massive, you know, heart opening and awakening experience for me. And you know, I'm now never getting back with a 21 year old and a 24 year old. And uh, mm. you know, and I've openly said to both of them, like, I fucked up lots of times. Like, you know, mm. I not an excuse. I thought, you know, I always vowed not to be the parent when my dad was. And when I look back, I was exactly what my dad was, you know, mm. probably showed up slightly different, but you know, same things, but we now have some very good open conversations. You know, my son does a lot of his own self-development work. He's probably coming more from the scientific angle or more spiritual angle, but that's fine. Yeah. But you know, I sit here today and my daughter's now living up in Cairns, spending two days on an Island, just, you know, looking after stand up pedal boards and, you know, now working in a, in a hotel, the other four, three to four days a week, just living her life. And my son's living up the snow, you know, took six months off uni and spent, is now spending time up the snow, just learning how to snowboard and being a lift attendant. And I'm like, you know what? I'm okay with that because one, they're mm-hmm. adults, two, they're living their best life, but now they know they can come in and we can have open conversations about what's happening in their lives and what's going on and talk on their feeling side and the, and the emotional side with them, which, you know, it's good. It's still, there's still challenges for me because I grew up in a very unemotional family. So to me to still lean in and say, Hey, I'm going to let you know how I feel is challenging. But unless I do that, then I'm not opening permission for anyone else to do that. And I realize mm-hmm. that I have, to, I have to lead with my open heart first, knowing that, you know, someone might come back and, you know, say something I don't like, but if, unless I'm going to do it, no one else is going to, yeah, that, I'm not giving the permission for others to come back and do the same with me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm very much like you. You know, I don't uh, give a shit <laughs> whether my children are lawyers, are doctors, yep. uh, and, and I'm not saying one is better than the other or if they're pushing trolleys or working at KFC, as long as my children are happy. That is all that matters to me. And, you know, for my close friends and family, they know that I'm not a massive advocate. Yes, education is super important, mm. um, but I'm an advocate for a good human being and I'm an advocate for common sense. So that's the things that I really love to instill in my children because I believe that those things will help them to be happy in life from my view. Um, and I'm really, my children are for the most part really happy children. So I'm grateful for the way that I'm bringing them up and navigating my way through that. Can I just quickly go back? for something because it yes, really please. stood out for me you spoke into the words uh, i vowed not to be like my dad and i just for anyone listening the reason why i want to go back and speak into this because it may land for someone because i know this landed for me when i first heard it um, i grew up and, and let's use my dad as an example you know, and my parents relationship i was always saying i will not be in a relationship like my parents i will not be a husband like my dad I will not be this about my dad. I will not be that about my dad. And guess what I got? Exactly that. Because I was thinking those things so much and I was speaking those things so much that that actually became my energy. Mm. And that's what was manifested into my life um, unconsciously. Because in those moments and in that experience, I didn't know what was going on for me. However, I'm now a person who is conscious enough to be very mindful of the thoughts that I think and the words that I speak. So, you know, yes, I don't want to be like my dad for this, this, and this reason. However, I can reframe that to the opposite of and be like, I will be an amazing partner and communicate and speak into all these things that I will have and that I will be and that I am and think those thoughts enough and speak those words enough. That will become my energy and guess what will manifest into my world these amazing, beautiful human beings and this amazing relationship or relationship with friends and family members. So I think for anyone who's listening, like if nothing else from this podcast, like take away the, how powerful our thoughts and our words are because that determines our energy. And I truly believe whatever energy we are walking around in is what we will receive from the universe. Oh, thanks for doubling back on that because – I love that you went back in that space because um, I now want to move into this other space around manifestation because I think you've now touched on a really good topic in that area. But you know, it's that whole don't look at the bridge and everyone will turn and look at the bridge, right? Because you've manifested or you pointed something out. And so you end up doing the exact thing that you don't actually do. Um, so, yeah. so let's talk a bit about now we've gone into that space, uh, manifestation and 
how we can reframe the conversations and reframe how we operate. You, you talk now that you meditate a lot and mm. there's a lot to do with, there's a lot of linkages between the meditation and manifestation and, and how that actually works. So what does manifestation look like for you in, in your world and how you're you know, framing that up to, to get the, the, the world that you want to move to, not, not the world you're trying to run away from, I suppose, if that's the right way of putting it. Yeah. So previous to, you know, the work that I've been doing on myself, I would hear people talk about manifestation and manifesting all this beautifulness into their lives. And old version of I would be like, bullshit, fucking talking shit. You think about these things and they end up in your space. You know, that was my mindset of manifestation. Um, but exactly what I just spoken to for me in simple terms, that's the way I manifest things into my life. And I will sit here and wholeheartedly say the things that I think, the words that I speak is the energy that I'll be. And in particular, the last two years, all these beautiful things have been just flowing into my world. Yes, I had that concept previous to the two years that I'm, I'm sitting in right now. The difference is I didn't believe it. Mm. I truly didn't believe it. Great example, I was at a coffee meetup with some friends the other day. One of my friends had altered her bank balance. And she was like, oh, look, I've altered my bank balance. And then giggled about it. I was like, oh, it probably won't happen. And I was like, interesting. Why did you change your bank balance to that? She was like, it's like manifestation. I'm going to manifest this in my world. And I said, well, it's not going to happen until you stop joking about it and actually start believing it. And she was like, oh, what do you mean? I said, notice when you showed me, you giggled about it. So you're kind of maybe somewhat embarrassed or shamed about showing us that. And she was like, oh, yeah, a little bit. I said, do you actually believe that? And she was like, probably not. I said, okay, there's the work for you. Start to believe that bank balance is actually fucking real. But first, that you are worthy of that. Mm -hmm. Because when you truly believe that you're worthy of that, your energy shifts. And then this conversation with this amazing person who's, got an opportunity to have different types of monetary values or energy into your space will flow. However, we keep sitting in the space of joking and not believing it, then it's just a thing that we're doing because everyone else is doing it. Yeah. And that really touches on this world of uh, the false positive of believing in abundance, but coming from a scarcity mindset. Mm. So the number of people go, I'm going to, I'm going to, I, I'm an abundant thinking financially. But they're also always worried, and it's because they're coming from an angle of I don't have enough, or I'm mm. not worthy enough, and so therefore I will call on this thing. And then for some reason, you know, what happens is that the bills keep coming in, or the car breaks down, mm. or these things happen. They keep going. Well, hang on a minute. Where's all this good stuff meant to happen? And so, I will until you solve for the fact that you, as you said, you're worthy of earning that amount of money, and you know money is actually truly not an issue for you or something that you're afraid of you know being desolate um then stuff will actually happen for you uh, so again it's a it's understanding that true belief and and really living that true belief yeah 100 bro um for me we and you know because we're speaking about money let's use that as an mm. example to uh speak into this you know we grew up with next to no money you know, on a Monday morning, we're, well, we're going to wait till Thursday uh, for payday to get some more milk. So we're going to have hot water on our wheat mix. You know, that was the life that we lived. And also, you know, connected to that was anyone who has money is fucking greedy and the, 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 the devil, you know, mm -hmm. for lack of better words. So I grew up with that belief that money is a bad thing and you're a, a bad person uh, if you have a lot of money. And 100%, I'm not worthy of it. And there's been times in my life that I've had lots and lots and lots of money that have, that's come in. But because I had this energy of and this mindset of I'm not worthy of it, I would blow that shit faster than it was coming in. So until I shifted that. So, you know, when people are like, I want to manifest this. And again, we're using money as an example. It's not even about going out and finding opportunities that are going to bring money in. Because you'll find that opportunity, you'll find that opportunity, and yes, money will come in for that moment, mm. and then it stops. So there's no flow. There's no um, abundant energy uh, connected to that. So for me, I would go back and unpack the story of where that all come from and then navigate my way through 
because I now sit in a space that I am 100% worthy of the energy of money. Why? Because it creates freedom and choice as opposed to it's greedy and, and our shit human beings. So yeah. the more important thing is to go back and unpack the, the programming behind it all as opposed mm. to going to find the money. Oh, absolutely great. On our side, you know, we've, uh, we, had, we had a great weekend away uh, early March where we actually went and stayed in a yurt, so like a Mongolian tent um, up in the high country in Victoria. And we're like, you know what? Ah, this is the life we want to leave. So we're like, in five years' time, we're going to have a couple of acres and we're going to have a sustainable hut cabin that's going to be built and we're going to operate on this place in five years' time and that's how we're going to operate. Now, I've got no idea how that's going to happen. No idea how it's going to happen. But what I, am going to, what I do believe is it will happen and all my manifestation is around that to the point where I visualize it. I, visual, I, I know how I'm going to feel when I'm there. I know how I'm going to feel around the countryside. And it's just constantly putting out the the energy and the vibrations in the, the place of it will happen and it will be what we want it to be and it will turn up. Now, it may not be exactly in that town we thought. It may be in a different state or whatever else. But the reality is it's the same with the vision boards. You can have a vision board, but you have to fundamentally believe in that's exactly what you want and that you are worthy of it, as you said to. So, you know, that's uh, I'm a huge advocate now of that that manifestation i, I know and unleash the beast sam lewis talked to it um there i don't know, know sam but he talked to him there and i'm like what the fuck is this your impression's going you know the universe always says yes and i'm like fuck off like yeah <laughs> you know, show me all the examples where it's saying no over here but but now i'm like oh shit yeah like even if you go let's just if it says yes all the time then why wouldn't i be asking all the right questions you know, like, Absolutely. Yeah. Why would I not be asking the questions that are actually going to give me this positive response that I'm after that I'm worthy of? And let's mm. just see what comes up. And, and I'll open up my eyes to what messages the universe is going to send my way. I agree, bro. And one thing I just love, and I'm just, uh, I'll just speak into it. One thing I'd love for you to ponder on is like, why not in the city or the town that you want it to be in? Why not the actual acreage that you actually want? Because, and this is only my view is like, is that I want this dream, but I'll settle for this bit over here. Like, fuck no, we are worthy of the whole dream. Mm. And quite often my friends and I have conversations about this in one year and two years and three years and five years. And then I go, cool. So how do we get to that five years? And some people, um, including myself previous would be, I've got to go find the big thing to get to that. Okay, cool. No, no, no. For me now, it's like, I'll backtrack, 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 backtrack to the day. And what I mean by that is find the smallest thing that I can complete an exercise on a daily basis that if I do that for the next five years, I truly believe that thing will be in my space. And it could be something as simple as every single morning for the next five years, I'm going to stand up and look myself in the mirror and dance my ass off, followed with five affirmations of that thing, the exact acreage, the exact this. And quite often, you know, especially in the self-development world, people are looking for the big scientific answer. Mm. People are looking for the program that costs twenty or thirty thousand dollars, hoping that that will be the answer. For me, and I truly believe, like, let's backtrack it all. When we complete the simple things in excellence on a daily basis that's what will get us to the thing that we actually want because all the answers lay inside of self the answers don't lay in all the big scientific answers there are some answers there the answers don't land the big 20 million dollar program no no no. the answers lay inside of you mm. so i'm a massive advocate for self 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 uh, uh beautiful and thanks for calling me on that and thanks for <laughs> putting that out there because that's what i love about this this podcast this conversation because we, we get to go into these different spaces so that's awesome um, I just want to also touch on, sorry about it. I don't know whether my, my Siri kicked in. So <laughs> apologies to the podcasters. You've only got a bit of Siri in there. The, um, I got a privilege to interview Jay Godfrey uh, last year uh, uh, mm. as part of the podcast. And I asked him about his journey. And he's like, yeah, fuck, bro. I'm going to tell you about my journey. I go to the gym one day. There's this fucking big bloke in there. And I sit down with him and we're doing a bit of a workout. And he goes, so, bro, how are you feeling? He goes, oh, no, I'm a bit tight in the muscles. He goes, no, no, no. How are you actually feeling? He's like, 
mm. what the fuck? I'm meant to be Papa Waits. But that, but that took him on his journey, like from, mm. from there. And, and I think you touched this, and I'm going to even go back to the start where you said working with those kids that, you know, that were like you and just understanding them and going, no, no, let's just have a conversation, but a conscious conversation about how are you actually feeling today? Let's just mm. unpack that. What does that look like? We just don't do that enough in this world. We just don't, you know, and our cells are responsible. Hey, for today, I'm really good, thanks, but you're not. You know, like mm. even we have an onus on going, you know what, I'm struggling with a few things today. You know, like even how we can start having those two-way open conversations of generally ask someone how you're feeling, be willing to actually ask it from the heart and be willing to respond from the heart about how you're actually feeling. Because for me, there's a lot of talk around mental health and everything else, but it's so super superficial. You know, are you okay, Dave? No one's actually, are, are you really asking, are you okay? Mm. Are you generally caring about whether they're okay or not? And are you generally answering? And I love that story from Jay because you fundamentally changed his life because he could see that you just weren't asking, how are you going? You actually were generally mm. caring about how he was feeling. And, and that was beautiful for me. Yeah, that's actually a really beautiful experience. And you know, I used to have people just in my local area that I lived in and we'd go to this park and train and following it, we'd all literally sit down and just talk about how are we actually feeling and have prompting questions, you know, or what does love mean to you? Or, you know, what's your relationship like with your mum or your dad or your children right now? You know, we had growing men with tattoos all over them sitting there when they're prompted with that question they're like they, they've gone straight to their heart space they've gone oh my gosh and the tears just start flowing mm. because for the most part in society it's like how are you yeah i'm good and that's the end of the conversation you know i for the for the most part uh, i'm really grateful for the community that i have around me where all our conversations are, are way below surface you know i'm asking like what's your relationship like with your dad right now have you navigated that thing that we spoke about last week oh no i haven't quite okay let's where are we going to move from uh from here moving forward or, or even backwards sometimes uh, but having conversations that are deeper than the surface there's not enough of them in the world however if humans that are conscious keep sharing from a place of love these conversations then it's going to prompt and support others to start having these conversations too you know something i struggle with is when people are out there saying oh you just need to fucking do this or fucking do that yeah easy for you because you're now conscious but remember there was a point in time that we were unconscious too and if someone had come at me and were like you just need to fucking do this rebel would have shut up and told you to get fucked mm -hmm. however if we speak to like hey my bro you know from a place of loving understanding compassion uh, from that energy and that angle, people are like, oh, and yes, they may not speak in that moment or the next one or the 10th one even. But if we keep coming from that place of love, you know, the hope is, and I think the chances are higher that more people start to have these conversations as opposed to fucking belittling people. Yeah, uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, yeah, one of the mantras of this podcast is, yeah, the right message will hit the right person at the right time. You know, mm. someone will be called in for some reason to listen to this podcast and go, oh, fuck, there's the nugget, you know, and it'll, and it'll just trigger something in their brain or in their heart and they go, oh, yeah, I can do this and that's what it looks like. And even if that sets them off on a, on a road of, a, of exploration, then, you know, that that's just super powerful. And that's why I love having these conversations here on the podcast because every different man brings a different element and a different story. But the fundamental underlying principle is every single man that's on this podcast is now just have, has an open heart and is actually saying, dude, like, let's just talk through this. It's okay. I, I'm here for you and it's okay to be vulnerable and I can help you feel safe. Where you didn't feel safe before, I, I see you and I see the mm. child that doesn't feel safe. I can actually help you understand what safety looks like and I can hold you here and I can take you on this journey. Um, and, and the more people that just slowly come along and work their way, some will have big bangs and some will have a slow burn, but the more that we can do it and the more open conversations we have globally, then, you know, we will end up in this return to what I think is a beautiful space where we once started, you know, um, probably pre Western Westernization of our worlds and materialization of our worlds. These are the conversations that used to take place. I, I strongly believe we can get back there and we need to lead that conversation. 
Yeah, I, I, yes, bro, for sure. And something you just said about, you know, the message will land at the right time. As you spoke, I was like, oh, something like came to me in that moment where, and the message is for someone that hopefully, no, not someone that hopefully, someone that will listen to this uh, because it came straight through me is hurt people hurt people. I understand this from a place of experience and deep embodiment. If you're listening to this and that is you, just know you've mastered that and you can also master the opposite. How do I know this? Because I am living it. I'm the embodiment of it. You got so good at hurting human beings. You can get so good, just as good at loving human beings. Yes, it's going to take some work. Yes, it's going to be yucky, but wholeheartedly it'll be 100% fucking worth it when you start to see amazingness in human beings and loving on all human beings, regardless of how they show up in your space. So I don't know. That was just something that someone's going to hear and go, fuck, I can do it. That's uh, that's beautiful, man. Um, often when I finish the podcast, I'll actually say, so what would be a message that you you may leave mm. for people listening I'm going to bypass that slip because you've just dropped that message in for people are listening in. So I love it. Yeah, there you go. There's intuition. You've just dropped that in space. Um, Perfect. But you, you've been super generous with your time today, Wa. Um, I truly, genuinely love you as a man. I love you for everything mm. that you're doing, the energy that you're putting out there, the support you offer, kids, uh, men, women, you know, the programs that you offer through Amend, Amend Movement are just phenomenal. Um, King Warrior, Queen Warrior. The walks that you actually do, um, I can't wait until you know the Australia settles itself down, and you know we can be more active in the amend movement down here in Melbourne. Um, I love interacting mm. with all the guys down here, but we can actually physically get on and do some walks and do some interaction. Yep. So, man, I, I cannot thank you enough for giving time because I know time is definitely something that you value and is precious to you. So, thank you very much. Mm. Thanks for sharing your journey, um, and you know some of the great wisdom that you got with with all the listeners and that just again love you man and thank you mm. love you too brother thank you so much for your time and space thank you for the service uh that you're providing for other human beings i think it's super important that many of us continue to provide uh, our knowledge love wisdom and experience for other human beings to uh, be guided through and, and for um and I'm deeply grateful that I jumped on this podcast because I've really enjoyed uh, the conversations that we've had this morning. Yes. Thanks, man. I really appreciate mm. that. Uh, it's again, much gratitude and love and you have a beautiful day and we'll chat again very soon. Love you, brother. Love you. So folks, uh, that was uh, Wah. And as you can see, you know, from the introduction, you, you can, should be able to pick up on the energy, but just how much of a humble, beautiful gentleman uh, that Wa is. Um, yes, um, he's had some, some challenges in his life, but I, I love the message that he dropped at the end. If you've learned how to hurt people, you can learn how to love people. And there's no more powerful message than that. You can just, we choose uh, what we want to do and how we move forward. So I'm going to end on that. Um, as you know, you can find me on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Uh, so that's it. End of episode 34. Again, thanks, Wah. You're such a beautiful man. And that's it. Bye for now. Much love and peace. Milvo.